seeing as how it's after seven, why don't we get the show on the road? Uh, so with the time being 7.01, uh, I'd like to call to order the Wednesday, January 19th edition of the Norton Select Board meeting. Let the record show that at present, uh, four members of the board are present. Uh, myself, Michael Toole, Meg Arts, Christine DeVoe, anticipating Renee Deli joining us momentarily. Uh, good evening, good evening, good evening. Let me pull up my agenda here. All right. Uh, I'd like to start tonight by opening up the public comment period. If anyone in the public gallery has anything they would like to uh, speak to this evening, uh, please feel free. Just indicate by raising your hand on the Zoom uh, interface or calling out verbally if you need to. I see no one taking advantage of that. So we will move on to the minutes. Uh, we have two sets of minutes for today, October 25th and January 5th. Uh, so any issues if we approve both of those today? All right, seeing none, Chair would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from October 5th, 2021 and January 5th, 2022. So moved. Second. Okay, motion from Michael, second from Christine. Go to the roll call. Uh, Meg, I saw you say yes. I couldn't hear you. Uh, Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. Uh, two and yes. Right. Jack? Yes. Oh, hi, Renee. I'm on. Excellent. Um, so Renee has joined. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to our next section, uh, appointments, resignations, retirements. We are going to shuffle these a little bit to uh, allow Chief Simmons uh, a few minutes to speak to EMS. Uh, so we're going to jump to uh, item number four on our agenda, the appointment of Caitlin Hayden as part-time director of Parks and Rec. Um, Mike, do you want to speak to this before Christine reads in the letter or vice versa? Um, why doesn't Christine read the letter and then I'll... I'll talk on it. Yep. Um, so to the select board from Michael Units, town manager, dated January 6, 2022, notice of appointment of part-time parks and director of parks and recreation. I hereby notify the select board that in accordance with the provisions of Article 4, Section 2, lowercase e of the Norton Charter, acting in my capacity as appointing authority, I have appointed the following individual as part-time director of parks and recreation, Caitlin Hayden. Said appointment was made on January 6, 2022 in accordance with the provisions of the Norton Charter and will be effective January 21st, 2022, unless the select board votes to accept or reject the appointment prior to that date. I specifically request the board's acceptance of this appointment with an effective date of January 24th, 2022. If I could, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please, Mike. Um, uh, let me say that we're lucky. Um, Caitlin came forward. Caitlin is a uh, lifetime Norton resident and currently serving as the Foxborough School Age Program Site Manager at the uh, YMCA Foxborough Branch. And she also is a professional figure skating hockey coach um, for the U U.S. Figure Skating USA Hockey and um, previously um, was marketing and communications manager for the Skating Club of Boston um, and also uh, worked at Camp Sunshine, a recreational retreat for children with terminal illnesses. So um, we're really looking forward to having uh, Caitlin on board and uh, couldn't have asked for a better candidate to come forward. And I don't know if Caitlin's on, Mr. Chen. Uh, don't see anyone by that name, but we do have a few phone numbers in there. Um, but uh, that's great. That's a uh, quite a cool background. Um, any questions for Mike on this? Seeing none, uh, Chair would entertain a motion to 
accept the appointment of Caitlin Hayden as the part-time director of Parks Net. So moved. Second. All right. Uh, Meg? I lost you again. Uh, your audio doesn't seem to be working. All right, I got a thumbs up. Uh, Renee? <laughs> Confirm Meg's thumbs up and I'm a yes. All right. Uh, Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. All right, two MES. Excellent. Mr. Chairman, before we move on, can I just ask the town manager a question? Certainly. Uh, Mike, is it possible to um, maybe just get some history, not right now, but maybe in a future meeting, regarding where this position has been from part full time to part time, and possibly what the future of it is, and if it's a something that the select board wants to set a vision on within the budget to maybe uh, look at this making this position full time. Sure, I can get that fire. So thanks, Michael. Uh, next up is number five, the appointment of Emily Archer to the full time clerical A group position in the Treasurer Tax Collectors Department. So Christine, if you want to read that letter, and if you turn it over to Mike. <laughs> and I lost the letter. One second. Okay. We're on the right one now. Okay. It's on the wrong one. Don't want to do that. Okay. So. Oh, wait. No, I'm so sorry. Can, can you repeat which one I'm reading? Because mine. Uh, this would be for Emily Archer. Okay, okay, weird. Anyways, um, this is to the select board from Michael Units, town manager, dated January 18th, 2022. Notice of appointment to full time clerical A group position. I hereby notify the select board that, in accordance with the provisions of Article 4, Section 2, lowercase b of the Norton Charter, acting in my capacity as appointing authority, I have appointed the following individual to the full time clerical A group position in the Treasurer Tax Collectors Department, Emily Archer. That appointment was made on January 18, 2022, in accordance with the provisions of the Norton Charter, and will be effective February 2, 2022, unless the select board votes to accept or reject the appointment prior to that date. I specifically request the board's acceptance of this appointment with the effective date of January 24, 2022. Please advise me, advise me if you have any questions. There we go. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Mike, so this is an open position that's being filled. It is, and um, many of you may know Emily. Emily uh, was a public safety officer at Wheaton College for a number of years and then uh, transitioned to uh, Norton Dispatch and currently um, is working for summer uh, dispatching. And she's decided to have a career change and uh, we're looking forward to having her in the town hall. Excellent, I was gonna say that name does sound familiar. Very cool. Uh, all right. Any questions for Mike on this? Seeing none, uh, I'd just like to note that uh, Meg had to reboot her computer uh, due to her audio issues, so she'll be joining again momentarily. Uh, all right. So, Chair would entertain a motion to accept the appointment of Emily Archer uh, to full time clerical A group position for the Treasurer Tax Collector Department. So moved. Second. All right. Uh, I think Meg's back on. So Renee. Yes. Christine. Christine. Yes. Okay. Michael. Aye. All right. Two MES. Uh, and as I said, we are missing Meg at the moment. So, all right. Uh, next up would be uh, Tom Avest for Conservation Commission. I do not have a formal appointment letter, but I do see that Tama is on. Uh, this is to appoint someone to uh, an opening on the Conservation Commission. Uh, for those of you who pay close attention to our meetings, as I know you all do, uh, Tama had uh, uh, put herself forward for the last opening that we had, uh, which we had three candidates for, uh, and very lucky that she decided to uh, pursue this opening as well. So. Uh, Tom, I don't know if you want to say anything before we get to the discussion. Uh, no, just just hello. And if there are any questions that anybody has, um, 
happy to, to answer them. I don't know if you need background on, on who I am, but I'm happy to talk about myself if you need me to. All right, I'll, uh, I'll open it up to any questions for Tama. Well, I think everyone remembers your qualifications from before, but uh, if I recall, you do have a background in uh, environmental science or law or something along those lines. Yeah, n not not law, but um, I I have a biology degree and um, I've worked in regulatory and safety for my entire career and currently work as the product stewardship manager for a manufacturing company. Um, spend a lot of time uh, delving into uh, chemical compliance and um, dealing with also with environmental issues um, that come up for our sites. So. Excellent. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mike. Um, and I just wanted to say that uh, I did receive an email from the conservation agent and the commission also discussed the candidate and informed him that they're looking forward to Ms. Vest's contributions as a member of the conservation commission. All right, it's always good to hear. All right, uh, well, unless there are any further questions, uh, I would entertain a motion to accept the appointment of Tom of us to the Conservation Commission. So moved. Second. All righty. Uh, Meg, you're back. I don't know. No, yeah. it's working. Okay, yes. good. <laughs> you're good. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Renee. Yes. Yeah. Christine. Yes. Yeah. Michael. Aye. Uh, two MES. Congratulations, Sama, and uh, best of luck. Thank you. Uh, at this point, we will jump back to the top of our appointments section for a threefer. We have three firefighter EMT positions to put forward. Um, Christine, I don't have them in front of me. If they're all the same, perhaps we can bundle them together at the same start dates. Yeah, yeah double checking. Right. Yeah, it looks good. Good. Okay. Oh man, then I went too far. Okay. All right. And I apologize. I'm going to butcher any of your names. I apologize. Okay. So this is to the select board from Michael Unitown manager dated January 5th, 2022. Notice of appointment of permanent full-time firefighter EMTB. I hereby notify the select board that in accordance with the provisions of article four, section two, lowercase b of the Norton charter, acting in my capacity as the appointing authority, I have appointed the following individuals as permanent full-time firefighter EMTB in the Norton Fire Department, Dakota Collins, Michael Foley, and Connor Timulty. The appointment was made on January 5th, 2022, and will be effective January 20th, 2022, unless the select board votes to accept or reject the appointment prior to said date. However, I specifically request that the board's acceptance of this appointment be effective January 31st, 2022. All right, excellent. And we do have uh, Chief Simmons on, and I see um, these three individuals all staring at me with ties on. So uh, we'll turn it over to you, Chief Simmons. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, we're definitely happy to be putting these three members on tonight. Um, you know, they're all quality candidates, um, and I think they're going to, you know, do really well for our department. So they've all passed the physicals, physical agility tests, so they've already been through the ringer. Um, and they have a, an academy start date of August 22nd. So that's the soonest date that we can get to, uh, to start the academy. So, um, all good people and we're, we're really excited to have them aboard. Thank you. Um, I have one question. How long do they have before they have to grow in the regulation firefighter mustache? <laughs> is that by August or is it when they come full time? I think November's over now, right? So they have they have probably till next November. All right, that's, that's the that's, mustache one. As long as it doesn't go outside the breathing apparatus. Exactly, exactly. It can't, can't can't get in the way of the mask though. <laughs> I would like to just show that uh, Captain Wilson is in violation of this policy as well. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to point that out as well. <laughs> So any other questions for uh, Chief Simmons or the three candidates that we have? Uh, I'm seeing shaking heads. All right. So with great pleasure, uh, Chair would obtain a motion to accept the appointments of uh, Dakota Cullen, Michael Foley, and Connor Timothy uh, as permanent full-time firefighter EMTBs in the Norton Fire Department. So moved. Second. 
Excellent. Uh, Meg. Uh, yes, and congratulations. Renee. Renee. Yes. Uh, Christine. Yes. Michael. Aye. And I too am a yes. So congratulations, gentlemen. Best of luck, and thank you for uh, for coming to Norton. Thank you. Best of luck. Thank you, sir. All right. And uh, Chief, you had uh, said you had a, a quick update for us. Um, yeah, if I, if I could, uh, I just kind of wanted to make all of you aware that uh, you know, thanks to a lot of the hard work from, from our EMS directors, Captain Wilson and uh, Captain Tyne, and in addition to our medical director, Dr. Fulton, who's also on tonight, uh, we actually now have six members of our department who are able to do uh, emergency ultrasounds in the, in the ambulance or in somebody's house or wherever they, wherever they need to be. So uh, Captain Wilson and Dr. Fulton are on, so I'll let them articulate a little bit more on the, the benefit of that to to our community and, and I'll let them take it from here. Thank you. So um, we we actually, believe it or not, we, we tried to start this before COVID came in and uh, that kind of went out the window. So it, it's been basically around for the last couple of years. Uh, there are some departments in our area that actually are using it. So we're a little bit late to the game. We'll end up being the best at it, but we were a little bit late to the game. Um, so we trained six people um, over the last two or three months. Uh, it was an eight-hour class that they took. Uh, from there, basically, we um, had them come to the station and uh, pretty much do ultrasounds on everybody. So um, you not believe some of the pictures we have around the station from the ultrasounds they did. Mm -hmm. And then we had uh, just recently, we had them do kind of like a final exam with our medical director and an ultrasound tech from Sturdy Hospital. They came in and basically, you know, gave some tips and, um, you know, just kind of took a look to see where they were. And uh, we put it on the truck about three weeks ago. Uh, already been used a couple times. It's um, it's going to work out really well. It's a uh, relatively new type uh, technology for the for the ambulance. Obviously, ultrasound's been around a long time, uh, but we use it more for the emergency stuff. Most of you probably know about it for you know ultrasounds when somebody's pregnant, things like that. We don't normally use it for that, but it's basically to you know see if someone's bleeding and uh, it, internally, and it basically can route us to a trauma center rather than like a local hospital. So um, couldn't do it without um, the support from our chief, from the management. Uh, our medical director, Dr. Thornton, she uh, pushes us on a daily basis to try to get this stuff. Um, for the last two years, I've heard, you know, why aren't you guys doing it? Everybody else is doing it. So um, she's a really good asset. So I know she's on. She wanted to say a few words just about, you know, how this is going to help out the community and the residents um, as far as this technology is concerned. So hello. There she is. But, so I'm Dr. Thornton, and I see you all looking very handsome, and my face has all the marks of the N95. That's the life of COVID. I just got off work. But I, I'm very honored to be at this meeting, and thank you very much for allowing me a, a couple minutes. I actually had a 20-minute talk. I was going to go over the uh, all the uh, bibliography of of research that's gone into ultrasound, but I think it's summed up in the commercial, I hope you remember, where there's a, like Socrates comes up to a patient and says, let's take a look. And then you have the doctor with the stethoscope and says, let's take a look. And then you have the doctor with the ultrasound and they go, let's take a look. I don't know if you can all see this, can you see this? Thorne, is your camera, um, is your slide on? Like the... Oh, dear. Look. There you go. Look. Look, that's the face with the mass marks on it. This is the ultrasound. Look at that. It's a cell phone and a probe. Genius. I wish I developed it. We couldn't put ultrasound out on the trucks when the crystals in the probes would break if they actually looked at it cross-eyed. Now, anybody can, you can actually drop this. This is my own personal ultrasound. I can travel with it. It's amazing technology. But the technology is here. It's only as good as the medics. And you folks in Norton don't realize you have the very best. And I see that your three that you're um, appointing tonight are EMT basics. I imagine that they will be brought along to be paramedics, and I imagine shortly will be people that I expect nothing but the best. 
And so I'm very grateful that Norton supports EMS like they do. And I should be at every meeting telling you what a great job they do. And it wouldn't happen if probably the best paramedic on the department is the chief. And Chief Simmons has supported all of this. He supports our technical rescue. He supports that people shouldn't introduce these people as firefighter EMT. They should introduce them as paramedic and then firefighter, because most of the, what they do is being a paramedic. And you folks in Norton can rest assured that you have the very best that are willing to adopt new technology, new applications, because we're going to find more applications for the ultrasound. And the expense of it isn't the ultrasound, it's the training. And it's the fact that you're willing to put that those dollars into training your medics so that they're the very best around. And if any of my other services are listening, I think they all know that we extol Norton as being really special. Foxborough did get it first. They have Gillette Stadium and millions of dollars. So they did get it first, but I do think, Mike, that Norton will be the second because I don't think Mansfield has it out quite yet. And we're clearly way ahead of the curve in Massachusetts. So anyway, I just want to finish with an anecdote, just so you folks can realize, you, you don't understand how special Captain Wilson, Captain Tyne, and Chief Simmons are, and all their medics. You, you don't understand. So there was a medical meeting, and there was a case, a great save of a very sick woman. And her she was riding in the passenger seat, and her husband's driving her around. And he's thinking she's just listening to him, and then she thinks he's a, he thinks she's asleep, and then he realizes that she's really sick, and he pulls over, and the doctor said, "And thank goodness he pulled over in Norton." That's what the doctor said, because the medics they treated her, and they treated her so aggressively that she survived without any injuries to her internal organs. And she was incredibly ill. And that's what a doctor, not me, I advocate for Norton and for EMS all the time. This was a doctor that, that they said, thank goodness she pulled over, that they pulled over in Norton. So that it was the Norton paramedics that treated her. So be grateful that they're so wonderful. You three new ones, you're gonna be tired of hearing from me, I know soon but welcome aboard but we expect nothing but the best from you. thanks for letting me me uh on if you have any questions please let me know it's not just Norton. you think you can bring a little more energy to the meeting <laughs> so uh, we appreciate your kind words all right thank you and thanks again norton we really appreciate it thanks dr norton uh, Dr. Thornton, before you leave, if, if this is Renee, if I could just ask a quick question. Sure. Um, I, I agree with you. I think we have the best here, and uh, I, I think the chief is, is a great leader, and, and all the folks under him are, are doing a fantastic job. Um, in respect to the, the ultrasound, like, what do you see are the primary benefits of, of them having this available? Like, what, you know, what, what do people get from it, and, and is it just the information that the hospital can have before they arrive? Like, can you, can you just walk through that in a couple bullets? Oh, I love the question. Do we have 30 minutes? Um, so I can tell you, oh boy, I could show you. Okay. So say you're uh, a chronically ill patient and you you have difficult IV access. Here's my ultrasound. Oh, here. I can put it up here. Let's see. I got to unfreeze it. I could show you my carotid artery. I don't know if you can see it there. You can see my carotid artery. Well, we're not looking at that. We're going to be looking at, but you need gel and everything to look. So they could find an IV when they didn't need it, but the big application that they're going to use it for right now in the field, Mike's cringing right now, Mike, uh, Captain Wilson, because they're not doing IV access with it. What they do is within 90 seconds, they can tell if you're hemorrhaging internally. 
they put the probe five places and you can tell if somebody needs to go to a trauma center or can come to the local uh, ER. Somebody short of breath, what's going on? Two places on the chest, you can tell if it's a collapsed lung that needs, they can decompress it. If it's pneumonia, where they need IV fluids, or is it congestive heart failure where they need diuretics? Boom, 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 boom. Incredible. And that's just what we're putting it out on the trucks for now. We're going to put it out for, we have more and more applications. One of the new ones is when we intubate a patient, you got the tube down into the trachea and you want to make sure that the tube's in the right place. You can actually see it with the ultrasound. Incredible technology that we can put out on the trucks and the guys aren't going to break it if they, guys and gals aren't going to break it if they drop this because it's not made with the crystals that all the other ultrasounds are made out of. When, when, um, someone, we, they went to Haiti after the uh, earthquake down there. They weren't able to take x-ray. They were able to take this. You can actually see broken bones with it. It's Wonderful. incredible. So this comes with all these presets. So you can tell the machine now. We used to have to figure this out with all these little buttons and gizmos on the big, huge machines. Now you just go, well, um, this is vascular access. What if I wanted to go to um, look at an eye? I can tell if your retina is detached. And this is all with this. I do bring a lot of, I, I, I see great applications for this. The expense for Norton is going to be in the training. And that's why any service can buy this. You have to have the interest to put a program together. And we give Captain Wilson a lot of kudos for what he does. And he's one of the most recognized names in EMS or in medicine in, in this area. It's Captain Tynan is putting together the program. So you guys just have resources of these great minds and wonderful paramedics. And so right now we're, we're using it mostly for abdominal to look for hemorrhage to see if they need to go to a trauma center. And the big one is the collapsed lung. And it's going to save one of your kids or one of your, your parents falls off. Of, you know, it's going to save one, somebody, you know, is going to be saved because they've been, they've had the foresight to go with this and get trained on. It's wonderful technology. And that's just a little bit of what they do. They do a lot. So thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Appreciate your passion for it. And and I can't wait for uh, an invitation from the chief and the captain on when we can come in and be a little demo. Oh, any you, we'll we'll have them at the next training. Perfect. All right. Thanks so much. I'm sorry to take so much time, but it is wonderful what they do. They should get recognized for it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Thornton. And as right. the resident select board member with Swiss Cheese for Lungs, um, perhaps that collapsed lung you scan will be mine. So there you go. Look forward to it. All right. Good night. All right. All right. Take care, guys. All right. Uh, very good. Thank you, Chief Simmons, Captain Wilson, uh, and our, our newest firefighter EMTs. Chief, did off. you? Chief, did you want to? Did you want to mention the grant that you just received? Oh yeah, yeah, totally slipped, slipped my mind actually. Yeah, so other good news is uh, we did just get a grant for about $8,400. It'll be applied towards uh, personal protective equipment uh, for structural firefighting for, for our members. So we just uh, just got notification uh, just about a little less than a week ago on that. So we're pretty excited about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we have a couple other, um, just, just so you know too, we have a couple other grants uh, that we've submitted for that are, that are really significant and help us out huge. If we can get them, I don't know if we will or not, but we're certainly trying. One of them is over four hundred thousand dollars for self-contained breathing apparatus, basically our impacts, and uh, we're also doing a regional grant in conjunction with Mansfield and Foxport to try to get new portable radios. A portion of that would be um, probably a little over three hundred thousand dollars if we were able to get that award. So, yep, awesome. Mr. Chairman, yes, Michael. Uh, Chief Simmons, this this is 
the third grant in a bunk in last year, right? We had the employee grant. Uh, and is, was this the second grant or was this the third? I, mean, I think this is the third, wasn't it? I think we're probably up in the four or five area, some, somewhere in that area, to be honest, plus the seat. Yeah, anyway, right. for yeah, you're something. your team for trying to, uh, you know, bring food to the town and obviously give your department through, through grants as well. Yeah, I think Deputy Keen's on here. He's, uh, he's, he went doc, but, uh, if he's listening, um, it's worth noting he's, he's done the vast majority of all of our grants. He's been doing an excellent job for us. So, um, in addition to Captain Wilson, too, has been doing a lot for, uh, CBE reimbursement and that sort of thing. So, <clears throat> definitely a team approach. Everybody's doing a great job. Well, it's, it's, it's funny because we were, we were talking about when we added the other, uh, Deputy Chief position, you know, this was your vision. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, you know, it was a lot of money and investment for, for that, that second position, but we, you know, it seems like it's been paying for itself. The first grant alone with the, uh, with the employee thing seemed to have paid for that position. And right. Paying dividends. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. That the position is paying for itself with the, with the grants, but, um, you know, that's only part of what that position does. It's helping us out in a lot of other areas as well, as you, as you all know. So, um, we're very appreciative and, and thankful to have that position and it's worked out you know, really yeah. well for us. I know Jay's brought a lot to the inspection side. Of the, of the yep. Of the for sure. Obviously. Yeah, we're very fortunate. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Chief. Uh, stay safe out there, gentlemen. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Have a good night. Appreciate it. Okay, good luck, gentlemen. All righty. Uh, before we jump into licenses and permits, um, we are going to be deferring one of our later agenda items, uh, still trying to coordinate the attendance for our, um, our legal team, uh, and that would be the uh, item under old business for or view and or vote to approve a mitigation grant agreement with American Outdoor Advertising. Uh, so that will be deferred to a later date to be determined. Um, so I appreciate your your patience, Attorney Manujian, as we uh, we work out this process. Thank you, folks. Uh, we completely understand, and uh, everyone stay safe, and uh, we'll wait to be notified when it makes the next agenda. Excellent. Thanks, sir. Have a great night. Thank you, folks. You too. All right. Jumping back in. Um, I don't know for, for licenses and permits. We have 2022 license renewals. So I scroll through my packet here. Uh, I can read it in if you need it. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, Christine, that would be great. Sure. Um, so this is a for the KMPZ Inc. does business as Honeydew Donuts at 61 West Main Street, and it's for a common VIC. All right. Uh, Chair would entertain a motion to approve the, uh, actually, clarifying question. Like, is this for 2022 when they're getting a really early start on it, or is this a new one? They're getting a really, really late start. That's the alternative. Okay. Very good. Uh, so, Chair, we a motion to uh, approve the 2022 license renewal for KMPZ Inc. DBA Honeydew Donuts. Come back. So moved. Second. Excellent. Uh, Meg? Yes. Renee? Yes. Dean? Yes. Michael? Aye. To am yes. Excellent. Scroll, 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 scroll. Back to. Um, and now a discussion and vote for, uh, to approve the transfer of the Comavic license from Bristol Beverages Inc. DBA Barrelsville Station to oh geez, uh, Umiyatum Corp. DBA Highland Farm to be utilized at 194 South Bristol Street. My only question on this was I thought they just switched owners. They, it's been they fairly did, recent. They did. Um, you may have done the liquor license transfer, but not the common pick. That's what it is. But it's okay. the same. The same owners that we that have been in there like six months ago, kind of thing. Correct. Okay. I'm not okay. sure if their attorney is on. 
this is the but one. They're changing their name. They didn't. Ch they didn't change the name before, but now they decided to change the name. Um, just confusing. <laughs> Is someone on from the company other attorney? No. Okay. I thought they might be on. That's all right. I just was curious. I didn't know. Um, yeah, th this is the one, if I recall correctly, it went from um, one uh, individual with the last name of Patel to another individual with the last name of Patel, which was uh, a point of confusion. But so it sounds like this is the wow. other half of the license transfer we did the alcohol and now this is just the common brick correct okay any questions concerns about this one see none uh sure. oh. no, no, no question mike yep. i know as we we obviously see insurance and all that i mean the the board of health and all that and all the inspectors would require uh safe serve and all that stuff right i mean this is it's a new restaurant oh. Correct. Yep. They have to get uh, permits through the Board of Health also. <clears throat> that was a mystery. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Chair, would obtain a motion to approve the transfer of the Common Vic license from Bristol Beverages, Inc., DBA Barrowsville Station, to uh, Umidiatum Corp., DBA Highland Farm, to be utilized at 194 South Bristol Street. So moved. Second. All right. Meg? Yes. Renee? Yes. Christine? Yes. Michael? Aye. Two and a yes. By the way, Jack, I was very impressed by that just rolled off the tip of your tongue, that name, like it was, like it was Smith. I, you know, you just got to commit to it and go. So confidence is the better part of valor. So. <laughs> uh, all right. This one, this one's a bit easier. Uh, discussion in our vote to approve the applications of Bog Iron Brewing. LLC for a live entertainment license and Sunday entertainment license. So, uh, do we have anyone on from Bog? As I am personally interested to see what this means for for them. I read something about it today. It, it's obviously that's their next step. They're going to be gutting the inside and doing some improvements now that um, we're kind of coming out of COVID. But very exciting. Right. Makes sense. Kevin, may I, may I ask a question of probably of the town manager? Sure. This would not, um, would this mean they just, are they allowed to have entertainment on the patio or not? Um, no, this is going to be inside. Fairly inside, okay. And, uh, you know, I will say, if I could, uh, that when the uh, studies were done with Serpent on what residents wanted to see, this was one of the number one things that people said they wanted to see in downtown Norton was more places they could go with some entertainment. So I hope this works out um, for Brian and uh, the business and for the residents to have a place to go and enjoy some music. Makes sense. And um, now that you mentioned it, Meg, I did see that post earlier. I just must have missed the entertainment piece. I know Brian said that they've recently been uh, allowed to increase their capacity from 49 individuals, I think, up to 160. So that is a huge game changer for them. Really excited that um, that, that was able to be possible. Oh, uh, any other questions, comments on this one? Seeing none, uh, Chair, I a motion to approve the application of Bog Iron Brewing LLC for a live entertainment license and a Sunday entertainment license. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, Meg. Yes. Renee. Yes. Christine. Yes. Michael. Aye. Two and yes. Uh, all right, congratulations to those folks. Uh, brings us to announcements. Uh, Christine, take us away, please. Alrighty, so the first announcement is for the Queensbridge um, Community Outreach Public Notice. I'm just going to read the first two sections. Um, notice, is to hereby, notice is hereby given that Queensbridge Group Inc. will hold a virtual community outreach meeting for a proposed adult use medical, medical use 
marijuana cultivation, manufacturing, and transportation establishment on Thursday, January 22nd, 27th, 2022 at 6 p.m. Participants may choose to attend the meeting either online or dial in by telephone. The purpose of this public meeting is to provide interested parties with an opportunity to ask questions and receive answers from company representatives about the proposed facility and operations. The proposed sitting sitting siting is 0 South Washington Street, map 24, parcel 62, Norton, and A0276. Um, so that's the first announcement. Um, then we have um, a cookie fundraiser for supporting the Norton High School track and field with Kate's Confections. Um, you can go to katesconfectionsnorton.com and order a dozen cookies up to four different flavors, I'm sorry, up to four flavors, nine flavors to choose from, and then you just have to specify what flavors you'd like. Um, and then you would pay the Norton High School track and field boosters via Venmo or by check, I believe. Um, the Cades Confection is donating 25% of sales to Norton Track and Field. Um, pickup is January 22nd at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the high school. Um, and then what was the next one? Buy those cookies. Uh, you know, once or once or twice, I may have uh, sampled some of those. Yeah. Alrighty. I and then <laughs> it's okay. And then the Norton Youth Baseball Softball is hosting a fun drive. Um, this upcoming one is January 22nd and also the 29th. Um, the, this is from 9 a.m. to 10:30 both days. Drop off location is at the Birch Hill Complex, and that's at 38 Plain Street in Norton. Um, it's collaborating with the Savers Fund Drive to raise money for the upcoming spring season, collecting donations of gently used soft goods. Um, and then we're going to have a Norton High School Music Department Mattress fund, Fundraiser. Um, so this is going to be Saturday, February 12th at the Norton High School. All money raised will benefit the Norton High School Music Department. And then uh, Norton High School Track and Field is also, um, indoor track and field is also hosting a calendar raffle um, through the month of February. Tickets are $10 each and the winners will be drawn each day. Um, you can purchase using um, Venmo or I'm sure you can go to their, um, actually their website is bit.ly slash Norton TF Boosters. Um, you can purchase a calendar there. And I believe the last one I have is um, the Biden administration announced that they're making at-home COVID rapid tests available to all residents through a new website-based ordering platform. Um, each, each household is entitled to four testing kits through this program. Um, these rapid antigen at-home tests can be ordered from the U.S. Post Office. You can use the website covidtest.gov to get your free COVID test. So take advantage of that. And I believe that's all I have. Thanks. That was a lot. <laughs> um, for anyone who has not gone on to the covidtest.gov site, uh, I am shocked to say that it actually works. And it was, I think it's because they used the, the U.S. Postal Service as a backbone for this. Um, it took about a minute to order tests. Everything seems to work really smoothly, which is not something you ever hear when it comes to federal government. So um, give them a tip of the cap for, uh, well, I guess my tests haven't arrived yet. So we'll just say, wait until you test. <laughs> to, to pray uh, and, the, and the post office isn't federal government, so that could be why. That's true. Well, it's federal. It's federal agency. Federal wish. And um, I, I guess, Sorry, I'll have, I'll have one more because our meeting is the same, our next meeting is the same time. Um, it's a, the hearing for, as what you talked about, kind of the transfer of common vehicular license from Home Plate Norton LLC to Goat City Pub Inc. Um, a virtual public hearing will be held on Wednesday, February 2nd at 7.15. Um, looks like it's going to be virtual. So, yeah, so the instructions are on the town website on how to join. So, and Mike, that'll be during our meeting, right? Yeah, so 
will be playing host for those folks. All right. Excellent. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, any announcements from any other members of the board? Shall we roll on through? Fantastic. Uh, on to new business. Uh, first up is a status update from Solar Retail Norton LLC and Exit 10 LLC. Uh, Renee, I'll uh, put you in the driver's seat for this one. Uh, you can put me in that seat. I see Andre on. Um, so Andre, why don't we why don't we start with you? Um, I don't see. Does anyone see Alex? Yeah, Alex is on. Oh, okay. I see him. So Alex, if it's okay, we'll we'll start with Andre and then uh, have you go after him. Okay, great. Andre, if you'd like to give us an update, we'd be happy to hear it. Happy to do it. First of all, hello everyone. It's great to see everybody and hope everyone's having a good start to the new year. Uh, I'll keep it pretty brief for you today. So I'm happy to report that we're approximately 90% through our construction at the site uh, and are actually planning on going for our certificate of occupancy in early February, uh, which will allow us to proceed with the state in pursuing our final licensing before the CCC can grant us approval to commence sales. Uh, we are targeting on opening uh, sometime in, in March, uh, probably mid to late March is uh, my best guess at this point. But there's a little asterisk there because there are some uh, elements of that timeline that are out of our control. But, you know, given the best information that we have, it's sometime uh, probably late, late March. And I'm happy to take any questions if folks have any. I can't believe it's where we're coming on to the time you guys open. When we were talking about it as a concept, so it's unreal. So it's great. The building looks yeah, great. Cool. It's definitely much bigger than uh, I, like I thought of in discussion. You know what's interesting, Renee? Actually, uh, it's only about a third of the building that's the retail. The rest of it is supporting. So offices, uh, you know, things like storage, uh, secure delivery. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I'm really excited with how the building's coming together. Excellent. Yeah, Have you had any um, challenges with uh, regards to construction? I know certain materials are increasingly difficult to come by as well as uh, labor and other resources. For sure. There definitely were a handful, but I'm uh, really fortunate to report that we've been able to navigate them both uh, in terms of materials and supply chain issues, but also labor with people. Lately, actually, a lot of the subcontractors, people are just out and can't work. So um, I think I would say those are kind of the biggest contributors to the slight you know, uh, delay from our original schedule. But no, I mean, we've been, you know, and you know, you just figure it out. <laughs> we've had to come up with workarounds and uh, I think it's a matter of, um, just working a little harder to, to figure it out, but excellent. Yeah, congratulations, and look forward to um, the grand opening. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll have a big uh, grand opening party, and hope to see everyone there. You're all very much invited. So we'll free sure samples. Up. Uh, uh, technically, I don't think we can do that, but we'll 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 do something. <laughs> we'll Maybe some sweatshirts or something. Yeah. Renee, I like where your head is though. <laughs> I'm all, I'm all about the free stuff. <laughs> um, so, Andre, I think it looks great. I'm really excited. And, uh, you know, it, it seems, to Michael's point, I mean, it seems like just yesterday that, you know, the, the EDC was, was reviewing this in the, the subcommittee review. So um, it's great to hear that you're you're close to opening. Um, I think it'll be great, too, in the springtime. It's a, a perfect way to kind of start something new and, and fresh. So I wish you the best of luck over the next couple months, and hopefully you stay on track in the CCC. And, and uh, I know Mike will make sure. You know, his, his folks are on top of it and helping you with what you need to get through it. I appreciate that, Renee. I also just quickly wanted to say that everybody in town has been terrific. Uh, obviously, everybody from the select board down through all the departments, the building department, inspections, water and sewer, everybody's just uh, been terrific in helping us move this thing along. So, uh, half tip to everyone in town. Great, thank you. And Andre, I know that we talked about um, you were interested in, in, you know, making sure that you guys were involved in the community. Um, so I, I think you heard earlier um, somebody has, has uh, been appointed to the Parks and Rec position. So um, yeah. I, I think that's great. That'll be a good contact. I know Paul has your information, and we'll make sure that that's passed along too. 
And, um, you know, one of the things that's coming up as well in April is uh, the, the um, Christine, the exact title, the um, Clean Up in Oregon. I think I think we're gonna try to pitch the one Norton day as like a the whole name, um, and it'll be like the town cleanup day at the beginning, and then go into the the one Norton day if we can get it to work. But it's a cleanup day, so we would love we would love assistance to help clean up the town. If if y'all can take that area on 123, that would be great. Oh, we're all over that. We're we all got already get you to sign up. Yeah, yeah, you got, you got, you got, you got, I already know where you got. You got from April the 23rd. Yeah. April 23rd. So yeah, it would be great. Um, Andre, if that's something that you and your, um, your colleagues are interested in, we'd love to have you participate. Absolutely. Counts in. Excellent. Thank you. Did you hear that, Mike? Did you like Keith know? Yeah. We got one signed up. Great. Thanks, Andre. Appreciate your Yeah, it's my pleasure, you guys. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Take care. And Alex? How's everyone doing? Good. How are you? Good. I don't know. I, I know I shared a couple, two, three slides with you. I can share my screen if easier. Um, not that it's a huge deal. I think the biggest thing for me, unfortunately, I'm not uh, as far along as Andre, um, but I did want to just revisit where things have gone and, and really where the delays have been. Um, you know, like Andre said, things come up. Unfortunately, the bigger thing that came up in the beginning of uh, the whole award of the HCA was that uh, Blue Star decided that uh, we weren't, uh, the cannabis wasn't a good fit, even though um, they had approached the town in the early stages uh, to actually partner with the cannabis company because they knew that the licenses were being distributed in the town. So uh, that was a, a, a bit of a time suck on our end. Uh, we tried everything to, to be involved with them, um, apart from just planting a flag there and, and starting to sell. Um, we tried to buy portions of the land from them. Um, we tried we tried everything and we wasted a, a fair bit of time doing it. Um, I have a bit of a timeline. Renee, does everyone have the, the couple of slides that I sent? Would it be helpful if I just threw it up? Yeah, if you can share, that'd be great. I did send it to everyone. I don't know if they've had time to see it. Let me see. But it'll help for others who have joined. Uh, one second, Mike. It's not. It's not behaving. Give me one sec. Uh, it's not letting me share. So that's okay. It's not. Uh, not the end of the world. I can. I'll have the sh slides available after my um, computer's not cooperating. So I'll, I'll see if I can get it. it. Try it again. Yeah, it's not letting me do it. That's okay. Again, it's not a huge deal. Um, there was two two main things that I wanted to touch on, and, and, and the timeline being one of them. So, so obviously, I was awarded the HCA uh, in December of 2020. Oh, there it is. There we go. Terrific. Thank you, Ray. Sure. Uh, you can go right to, to the next one. I'm going to just get other things off the screen here. Okay. So that's that's kind of where things have progressed to. Uh, basically, starting in April of, of last year, uh, amongst navigating COVID like everyone else, um, I, I was essentially homeless uh, in that regard. So Basically, what happened is, you know, I continued to pursue different sites. We looked at a lot of sites. I had obviously various conversations with Renee on what, you know, we thought would be the best for Norton, best for, you know, us as a business and, and really being long term in the community. Um, we had opportunities and in, in sites like South Washington and sites that, you know, could fit the build, but um, weren't necessarily good retail long term sites. Um, we eventually came upon after, you know, banging down doors, um, Old Colony which was, uh, had recently been um, moved into the zoning for cannabis. Um, the site we actually were able to secure uh, is a site that actually, looking back at it, checked a lot more boxes because it was kind of revitalizing that area. So uh, it actually, you know, long-term, uh, if you look at it in, in its location, it, it fits really well, I think, not only into um, 
cannabis, but into retail and, and how we were really assessing properties that would fit this uh, overall use. Uh, so we're currently in uh, the PNS stage. We're just getting through some of the bank financing stuff, uh, appraisals, environmental, things like that. We had the uh, community outreach meeting. We were met with some some, some really positive feedback. Uh, if you're familiar with that area and familiar with that specific site, uh, I'm sure you know that a little TLC will, will help improve that quite a bit. So everything being said, we're moving ahead. As it pertains to the, the arena of cannabis, uh, as this year progressed, and I can't believe I'm saying it was a year, but a lot of things changed in that regard. One is that a lot of these grow facilities that had not been in operation had finally come online. That's that had brought, you know, pricing to a completely different area has dropped margins, has done a lot to impact uh, the overall business of, of cannabis and really put a strain on retail only uh, dispensaries in that as well. Uh, the company uh, cultivate that I was, uh, weighing heavy on had sold to a company called Cresco Labs. Uh, throughout this process, you know, I've maintained relationships with a lot of people. One of the one of the larger relationships I had as well uh, was with a couple people at Merriman. Uh, in that process, we've had discussions. We've, we've kind of brought this full circle as far as back to a mentorship. And while I feel great about the security of the site now, uh, being an old colony and being able to move quickly because the conversations I've had with general contractors and things like that, I think that there stands an opportunity that I wanted to present to the board uh, and kind of gauge interest and, and, and feelings on is the opportunity to potentially partner with someone like a Merrimet. Uh, Merrimet is a, a large MSO, they are multi-state operators, and what that would allow me to do uh, if you look at the overall business of it is, uh, you can, as a single, um, kind of seed to sale company, uh, one thing that improves heavily is, is, is margins is opportunity to, um, to really benefit the community by doing things like medical as well. Uh, and, and I'm sure it's a lot of things you saw with, with what solar had to offer. And the thing that exacerbated the whole problem throughout this past year has really been the fact that, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of retail dispensaries come online. There's been a tremendous, uh, drop in pricing and, and, uh, and, uh, sorry, I just totally blanked. There's been a tremendous drop in pricing and profit in these retail only dispensaries. So, uh, what you're seeing is a, is a huge consolidation in the market from these large MSOs, from these larger, uh, companies that have, uh, the opportunity to really scale at, at at, at least beyond uh, retail only. And, and that's in the wholesale business, it's in the grow business, it's in the medical, it's in product development, it's in branding, marketing, all of the above. Uh, and where I was going to leverage a lot of the marketing and expertise on the side of the Cultivate, um, I think that there's a tremendous opportunity with a partnership here that would allow me to, to really be much more profitable and contribute much more to the town uh, by by potentially having a real partnership with a company like Merrimack. And I've included, so um, Ryan Crandall, the Chief Revenue Officer of Merrimack is on the, on the call as well. I invited him uh, to speak to a little bit about who Merrimack is. And I don't know if that's necessarily um, something the board, I'd love to kind of get some quick feedback now just to see if that's something the board would be interested in is hearing a little bit more about them. Um, and if Renee, you want to go to the next slide and kind of jump back and forth, but uh, this is just to give you an idea of who they are and. The next slide gives you an idea, just the breadth of, of opportunity um, of products and things like that, that they're able to scale to. Um, but it's kind of twofold. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. So, so I guess the update is we're moving along. Um, we're moving in the right direction. We feel really solid about the opportunity we have, where we have it, and how it um, lays out and fits in the town. Uh, I think that the thing that would put us kind of a, a a league ahead would be to partner with someone like this and, and really continue to push, push things forward even, even faster and, and, you know, more profitably. So I can let, I can let Ryan, if you want to just chime in and just give a quick, um, 
quick idea of, of Merrimad as a whole and, and who you are and who's the chief revenue officer of the, of the company and, and kind of where you guys foresee your, your brand going. Sure, happy to. Um, <clears throat> and thank you everybody for having me on. Um, so my name's Ryan Crandall, I'm with Merrimad. Uh, we are actually, a, we're an MSO, multi-state operator in cannabis, but we're local, right? Uh, our headquarters is in Norwood, Massachusetts. Uh, we've been public since 2017. Uh, you know, the company is based here. Uh, I'm from Raynham. I grew up in Raynham, went to Raynham, Raynham Public Schools. Uh, I live in Foxborough today with my two kids. Um, you know, I started a, a cannabis brand uh, back in 2014 called Betty's Eddie's and ultimately sold Betty's Eddie's to Maramed in 2017 and then came on to run product and sales. Um, so I left a, a software career to come into cannabis uh, years ago. And it's been it's been a wild, uh, you know, and fun ride. Um, you know, we Maramed, we started cannabis operations in some other states as we weren't awarded licenses in the first round here. Um, so we, we really kind of cut our teeth in cannabis in, in the state of Maryland and Delaware, uh, and also partnered with a company in Rhode Island for a number of years. Uh, more recently, uh, we have been licensed in the state of Massachusetts. Um, so we have a cultivation and processing facility in New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, where we employ well over 100 people. Um, we make the Betty's Eddie's brand in that facility. We make Nature's Heritage cannabis products, which are flower-based products. Um, widely regarded as either the number one or number two flower products in the state. Um, and Betty's Edibles, so Betty's Eddie's, uh, you know, has the number one and number two edible products in the state. So to Alex's point, I mean, his partnership, potential partnership with us uh, really could, could mean that Norton is going to have, you know, access to the best products uh, that cannabis really offers today in Massachusetts. Uh, and we're excited by that. Um, you know, we've opened our own uh, retail store in Middleborough uh, that opened at the end of 2019, uh, right at the start of COVID. Uh, it was medical only to start. Uh, and in September of 2020, uh, we opened for adult use in that facility as well. Um, everything has gone really, really well with Middleborough um, and that facility. And, uh, and we'll be expanding a second dispensary in Beverly, Massachusetts at the end of Q1 that we're well underway with. And our hope would be that we can work with Alex around uh, partnering on this dispensary in Norton, Massachusetts. Great, thanks, Ryan. Hey, Alex, I, I'm just wondering, um, I saw your note on there about Cultivate and, and then selling. Are you no longer, does you no longer have any relationship with the folks from Cultivate? I have a relationship. Um, unfortunately, as part of their sale, um, their expertise or, or role in the companies has shifted. And I don't know that um, kind of the, I don't want to use the word agreement, but the mentorship that we had before is going to necessarily um, be there to facilitate what the original plan was. Um, you know, as, as chance would have it, I've known Ryan for going on probably 17, 18 years now. And, um, and it was funny how things collide. And, and during this process, he's been kind of a, a, a good shoulder for me to, to bounce things off of. And as the discussions kind of started happening, as I was bouncing things off of him, he said, well, you know, maybe there's a, there's a chance that we should look at this together. And the wheels started spinning and, and we really kind of fell into it a bit uh, as I was navigating, obviously, the, the difficulty with the location, with trying to find a site that works and, and really the upside in the changing industry that changes on a dime, right? So um, it's, it's been one of these things where uh, while we were still able to continue, I was still able to continue to kick the ball forward. And, and I feel like it, the, the spot is really going to be a strong spot for, for the use. Um, I think that this really takes it to another level to really not only help us get open and be successful from the, from the door, the doors open, but I think that it helps us put, a, put us in a position where we can be successful and continually be successful because uh, there's a backbone there that's continuing to develop brands. Um, you know, uh, really understand a market in multiple states and the evolution of what's coming to Massachusetts from other states and how that impacts um, kind of our feet on the ground here. So uh, it kind of, the picture became a lot clearer to me as, as Ryan and I started discussing the opportunity here. And while, you know, while the ball's moving forward regardless, uh, I thought that I would present to the board and, and I think there's a huge opportunity, obviously of Solar who has, a lot of similar um, 
attributes as a as a as a retailer um, to Marimed. I think that one one strong thing that they provide and, and can provide me is is that whole breadth of not only products but that backbone in the industry, multi-state operator ability for medical ability for you know uh, keeping margins so that everyone kind of profits here and, and the town is is a beneficiary of that as well. So I think there's a real opportunity there. Not to say that um, any of this. <laughs> Uh, was the plan at the beginning. Uh, I think that it does at this point kind of make a ton of sense and and I wanted to present it to the board to, to see if they felt the same way. So so how would that change, Alex? Because I think the last time you were at the board, you did an amendment um, to change ownership with your, your wife. Is that correct? Where she became 51% owner? Yeah, so originally the idea was um, to move forward as part of a woman-owned business with my wife. Um, we've always just been the only two partners in the business. Um, and that was kind of the original thought with more of a licensing uh, agreement with Cultivate. Um, that was never formulated because they were obviously in the process of, of, of selling, um, uh, unbeknownst to me. So uh, as this would, we, we haven't necessarily navigated all the details because uh, I wanted to gauge the board's interest in, in us moving forward with this, but ultimately what would happen is there'd be a shift in ownership and we'd have to come amend the HCA for whatever that shift would be um, as, a, as a real true partnership in, 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 the, in the company itself. And is that something that you're planning on, on presenting to us in two weeks? If that's possible, yeah. I, I, I mean, if that's what um, is possible, I think that our goal would be to kind of iron out some details and figure out, you know, what the partnership looks like and have more details for you so that there'd be some sort of agreement there going in, in a couple of weeks, if that's possible. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't have any questions on it. I mean, I, I think, you know, to your point, you're leveraging um, a, a, a company that is very well positioned in the industry to, to kind of help, you know, in this next phase, now that you, you battled the location and, and, um, the issues with the property, but uh, certainly I'd, I'd ask if the board has any questions that they'd want to raise now, whether we have answers, you, you have answers to provide us now, or we, we discuss it more next week. Thanks, Renee. Uh, I think my biggest question is more of a, a matter of curiosity. I see Emac and Bolios, which I recognize <laughs> as a, a pretty premium ice cream brand. Uh, I'm, I'm curious how that plays into uh, your business model. Um, Happy to talk about it, Jack. Uh, yeah, I mean, we announced about six months ago a partnership with Emac and Bolios. Uh, so we, we've uh, my my CEO and and the owner of Emac have been friends for years, uh, and always wanted to, you know the guy at Emac always wanted to do cannabis ice cream. We've got a very cannabis friendly brand, and uh, he's allowed uh, Marimed, specifically Betty Zetties, to license. Uh, his ice cream recipes for cannabis. Um, so we'll be coming out um, likely by April timeframe uh, with cannabis ice cream, both vegan and dairy ice cream, uh, using Emac and Bolio recipes and certainly giving them props on the container, uh, but it'll be under the Betty Zetty brand. That is absolutely. You might have also awesome. seen the uh, giant brownie make waves throughout uh, social media from, from Bubby's Baked not too long ago. I forget what that was for, but it was. How big was that brownie, Ryan, that you guys it, ate? Yeah, it was 850 pounds. It, it ended up getting to Jimmy Kimmel. It was crazy. Yeah. Like, we literally were just doing it as a PR stunt, and it, like, it was uh, kind of insane, the reaction, but fun. Uh, so now we've got dispensaries across the state asking us to make a paper mache 850-pound brownie and take it on tour. So <laughs> we will see. All right. Well, cannabis ice cream sounds downright diabolical. I wish you luck with it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We do have a local ice cream uh, plant in town too. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> and lots lots of, of partnerships there. See, the yeah. wheels start spinning. You, you <laughs> goes fast. Trust me, I know mine's always going. They're one of the largest ice cream uh, consumable companies. They package individual ice cream for uh, uh -huh. ice stores and so forth. It's pretty big. Yeah, they do contract manufacturing, right? Yeah. So Renee, you think the best thing to do would be to get a little bit more details around what the partnership looks like and, and come back in two weeks? I think so. 
Um, does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to hear more about next week? I, I don't know that Jack can talk. It seems like uh, his dog and potentially uh, one of the daughters are taking over. I'm good. I've scared them off. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, a hug from my daughter is worth uh, the interruption any day. Oh, there you go. That was worth it. <laughs> yeah. There so, yeah, Alex, I, I think that's a good idea. I think um, let's plan to have you on the agenda next week, and then if you can share documents with us a few days before the meeting, and I can sure. I can um, share it with the board for their review prior to our discussion, that would be helpful. Terrific. No, I appreciate everyone's time, and, and I know I was a little long and winded, but I definitely wanted to go over kind of where we started and where we're at and just express some of the hurdles. It's not that we've been running in place. It's just that we've been running so hard that we kind of, you know, lost track of time. So. Right. And, and Alex, did you share with us, um, I know that you, you met with the building inspector and I think the chief as well. Um, like yep. what, what's your, and if I missed this earlier, I apologize, but what is the timeline for like some of the work to start on the property? Yeah, so we're just, everything's been slow due to COVID. So just the whole PNS part, getting people out there to evaluate and do um, appraisals and environmentals. And we're seeing this everywhere. It's just, it's kind of this, this dragging process. It was actually a six, we had signed the PNS weeks to weeks ago. It was a four to six week lead time just to get appraisers out there. So they were actually there last week. I met them out there. Um, we're looking at um, an early February close, assuming all the thing, everything comes back, you know, copacetic. Um, and then right after that, we'd get, get our architecturals done and get that process started and submitted to the town. And I've already met with contractors there. We have a, we have a pretty great relationship just through my, my other life with Duncan through some general contractors that have already given me rough ideas and timelines, assuming that, you know, things with the town and, and, uh, building and stuff gets approved. That's why I proactively sat down with, uh, uh, the building inspector. I afraid he kind of, we went over what was in place where we think we're going to get to and that kind of step one, step two, step three of the plaza, because as you know, that's a three building plot, well, four building uh, plaza with the idea being that a lot of the focus right off the bat is going to be to get the dispensary up and running with kind of a phase two on, on the fishermen. So we went over all those plans. We made sure that um, fire department was good with access, was good with, you know, in and out and stuff like that just as we get to that next level that we proactively have their blessing to say, hey, this is what we talked about and here are the plans. So we're trying to do everything we can to, to stay ahead of it. And, you know, like uh, like Andre said, the solo, we're trying to account for some of the delays by by kind of keeping one foot uh, in front of the other here. Okay, great, thank you so much. Well, no I think we can do that. Mike, can we plan to have them on the agenda for the next meeting? Sure. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for everyone's time. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Appreciate it. And thank you, Renee, for facilitating that discussion. Uh, exciting updates. Yeah, uh, next up, we're going to turn it over to uh, Michael for a discussion on public works departments. Thank you, hey, Jack. Um, I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. Not going to be a PowerPoint. It's going to just be an overview of a handout that I had. Um, can you guys see that? Yes. Yes. Yep. Um, so one of the things that we that have talked about is the um, an article for a town meeting um, and a proposing a proposal that would combine the Norton Highway Department and the Norton Water Department into an umbrella underneath the Department of Public, uh, creating a Department of Public Works. Uh, the proposed the proposal is to find uh, employee costs um, and in equipment synergies and savings uh, while looking for opportunities to expand additional town services. In the process, the director of the Department of Public Works would be an engineer um, or have an engineering background um, that could review and maintain town projects and oversee the Department of Public Works. Um, the, just to give you an overview, we've had two working meetings. Inside the working meetings have been um, Michelle Brown, assistant to the town manager, uh, Mike Yunick, town manager, Key Silva is the um, superintendent of the highway department, uh, John Harrop, who's the assistant superintendent of the water department, um, myself, Frank Fournier, who is the superintendent of the water department, and Steve Bishop, who is on the uh, water, water and sewer commission. 
Uh, what it is and what we're proposing is, again, well, what I'm proposing is the water commission would stay put, but it would now go from a elected position to an appointed position. And again, both the water and sewer department uh, and the highway uh, department would fall under the director of public works. So again, one of the things that we're working on is, and one of my main goals is, there's a lot of capital uh, capital equipment that each department has that they might be able to find some shared um, some shared savings on maybe one um, one piece of equipment for that. The other thing that we're going to be able to see is on specifically not the licenses because the highway department has certain licenses and the water department has certain people that have certain licenses, but on positions and jobs that labor is required, we're able to see synergies and crossover right within that. What we're being uh, what what is uh, some of the frequently asked questions that uh, is this is why is the article being proposed? Is obviously an effort to for cost savings with employees, capital equipment. And to hire a supervisor engineer of town project project. How will the engineer be paid for? Uh, it will be a combination of town budget and enterprise account for the water from the water department. Does it eliminate the water commission? No, and this is one of the things that I really want to stress. This is not an effort to eliminate the water commission. Actually, it's the opposite. It would, they would serve in the same role that they're serving now, but they would be appointed as the select board from the select board. So does um, does the water uh, enterprise account remain uh, intact? Yep, it does. Uh, does the uh, does this eliminate the water department or the highway department? No, there are two departments underneath the Department of Public Works. Jack, I'm going to just finish up the questions and answers, and then I'm going to kind of just give it a little more overview about the last two meetings, and then I'll open up for questions. If that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, each department requires different licenses uh, for each specialty. So. So they can't cross over. They absolutely can. It's a yes and no on those specialty skills. They can't cross over, but we might be able to cross license people. But that has to be determined. Um, but on labor projects and so forth, there will be crossover. The public works department uh, engineer sounds like a waste of money, and is uh, and uh, as we already hire an engineering firm. Well, this is one of the things that I really am um, passionate about. We're about to take on a lot of infrastructure projects for the town. And we need another set of eyes that have the town's best interests over uh, ensuring that these projects are on track and correct. We saw a uh, kind of a setback on uh, the uh, West Main Street project um, due to ledge and so forth. That may have been caught by uh, an engineer and so forth. Do um, other towns have public works departments? Most towns have a version of public works departments, and I can talk about that in more detail. Um, are elected water commissions better? Since 2001, there has been there's been consistent open seats and joint appointments both by the Water Commission and Select Board. So realistically, it wouldn't be much of a change than what we're going through now. Uh, with the change of the role, um, would this change will um, change the role of the Water Commission? No, it would still serve as the advisory, advisory role to the Water um, the Water Department. And other boards, uh, do other boards serve uh, in the capacity that are appointed? We see this in the Conservation Commission, Board of Health, the Zoning Board of Appeals. And then uh, last one, uh, how would hiring and combining departments, uh, how would hiring and combining departments and hiring a high cost engineer save money? Well, we see savings within labor costs uh, and specifically on just where we just made, made manpower, capital equipment, and then project oversight on combined, combined efforts. So, I'm going to back up in just this, and then I'm going to probably stop sharing and then just kind of give you an update of what the working committee has done. The working committees had two meetings. Um, it was actually the last one we had the majority of, um, we had um, Frank, um, John, uh, Steve Bishop there, and they really kind of drilled into saying, is this really necessary? And so forth. And we, we talked through, uh, through a lot of things. They're still not 100%, and I'll be presenting to the Water Commission on the 25th of this month. Um, or next Monday, and it's one of those things where I was we talked to them about it, and they were having trouble. One of the big things they were looking for, they thought we were going to combine this into one department, so they would be in the departments will still remain different because they have different functions. But where we see savings on is there's a water main break, 
we see uh, shared savings and efforts on that. If there's a huge storm, we see benefits on that. Mechanics, you know, maybe they, they can they have a lot of equipment that is overseen. We possibly on mechanic costs be able to combine and, and save on those fronts. So those are just some of the examples that, that we use. Um, and we we Mike and myself have a meeting with the um, director of public works to kind of he's one of the uh, individuals that forms the uh, public works over in Mansfield to kind of give us an idea of what some of the challenges were when he was uh, forming the, uh, the public works department over there. Um, Mike, did I miss anything that, uh, or did I kind of cover most of the, the issues on it before we open up questions and discussion regarding the proposal and, and, and so forth? No, I think you covered everything. Yeah, and, and, I, and I know it was kind of, I went rambling there, Jack, but uh, that was the, the gist of it. You know, one of the things that I would like to find, find out from the uh, select board is, you know, this is one of those areas that I've been passionate about uh, making sure that we kind of find ways for both departments to work together, um, save money, expand services. And that's one of, ultimately, you have to first do this before you can really start considering expanding services. Um, and and I, I think this is this is kind of a step forward as I look at our town and move it forward. And, and, and the future for the future. So I'll open the floor to, for discussion with uh Thanks, Michael. Uh from from my perspective, uh you have my full support and uh, really appreciate the, the hard work you and the, the working committee have been put into this to try to find the best uh path forward. This is one of the items from the recent charter commission suggestions that um I was most excited about. So I think if we can bring this around in a different way, uh, it's going to just have multiple benefits for the town. Um, I think Mike will even talk about some of the benefits between highway and sewer with the recent snowstorms, right? So I think you're already seeing some of the benefits there. So um, yeah, great job and thank you for, for leading that. Yeah, I mean, it's still a Herculean task check. As you know, it first has to go be approved by town meeting, then it has, because it's a charter and a bylaw changes, then it would have to be voted on by the citizens. But, I, you know, my and this is one of the things that uh you know it's one of the first things you see here when on my on my slide was this is a new proposal people just just remember a couple of years ago where the water department where the water commission was attacked and i i tried to tell some uh, students like that's that's not what, what we're trying to achieve there not at all we want you to stay put serve but we want you to serve just like the conservation commission the board of health the zba we need you, we need you involved in, in giving guidance and direction to the water department, but we need to combine these two, um, these two departments so we can start trying to save, save money, but then also try to look at the standards. Michael, can I ask on that too? Um, I noticed you didn't have, or I didn't see anyone from the, the commission as part of the working group. Have you engaged any of them for feedback or discussion? I have not, Renee, and, and the only reason I had not was was not um, was I just looked at stakeholders, you know, that I looked at the departments on on what we has and that you know, um, but I am open if I would be glad to share my, um, my 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 email and so forth. If there is a, the other members that want to be, if there were citizens that want to be be part of this, um, kind of looking at this project, I'll be glad to open it up. And this is not a Michael Tool show. This is just kind of me just trying to push it forward because I really am passionate about the idea of uh, this department, these two departments coming together. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think just, you know, having their perspective on that. And, and the other thing, because I know you put in there that they're like an advisory board, but I think that they have a little more um, authority, like right from a policy and approval perspective. So I just think that you know, if, if those if those responsibilities are staying the same, or if they're they're going to be changed, it would be nice to see you know how that how that commission changes, because um, I think it is right now more than an advisory board. But I'm I'm with you. Um, I got to tell you, you know, you mentioned the cost of, of bringing an engineer um, with the the cost that we spent, um, you know, multiple times going back to town meeting for additional money for you know a, a third party to to be advising us. I I think that that position is um, well justified within the town to have somebody who can really keep an eye on the project and, and, you know, not, not be the project manager, but make sure that they're running efficiently. Um, I think it's a cost savings effort. So I'm, I'm behind this. I, I think it's a, 
I think it's a good move. I think that there, you know, to your point, there's synergies there, and um, why not build upon that? Yeah. So Renee, let me just uh, kind of this. What I'll do is I'll let me define on what uh, some of the stepping points of the new of the water commission, what they would look like, and maybe be like, oh, this is what they currently did. This with this. I don't see it changing because they usually just. It's more. I'm going to back off of that that last thing that I just said, and let me just do a compare and contrast of where where I see this going. Um, I, I think it's, it's conversation with the working group to say, you know, this is what the current responsibilities are. Does it make sense? Or, you know, you may even decide in some areas that, that responsibilities are increased um, or shifted into the new the new position. But I, I, I just bring that up to have it be discussed because I like I said, I, I think that they're more than just an advisory board right now. So I don't I don't know what the full intent is, but I, I like the concept overall. Yeah, and and I'd, I'd be lying to you if I said the uh, the water department and the water commissioners were like, yeah, this is great. They they you know something they were cautiously observant. They were drilling me, you know. They they brought their concerns. Um, it was very it was very open and it was a very open conversation and, and so forth. So it's one of those things that uh, you know it's some of the things that they have were just misperceptions perceptions of what it would look like and um, hopefully I advance some of those concerns within the uh, within the uh, frequently asked questions and I'll be presenting them on Monday. Great, thank you. Yeah. Mega Christine. I also think it's um, a much needed um, part of our, our town government. I, I don't understand why we've been so being a small town, I don't understand how we don't maximize our resources and put them all together. So I think it's great. I applaud your efforts um, and hopefully the town agrees. We can move forward. And uh, one of the things that I will, will do the next time we update this, you'll have the actual wordings of the proposals. Um, so what I will do is I'll put out the exact the actual wording and I'll put in uh, what's being proposed to the change and what's being deleted or what or what the original is. Okay, so you'll be able to kind of compare and track and contrast, and then uh, I will attach the actual what will be going on to the warrant as well. So we, so we, you know, one of the things that I just want to make sure that uh, I don't get caught up on is little wordsmiths. We, you know, there are obviously legal and legalese within the with wording within our uh, bylaws and charters, and uh, you know, this this group is very good at saying no, no, that means this. Uh, so and that's important to me. Make sure we get this wording on this correct. I'm sorry, Christine, do you have any um, thoughts? Um, just if I could, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mike. Um, I think it's important, my, just my own personal opinion, to keep um, the commission, even an appointed commission. Um, I know in my town, they formed a public works department and the select board of the public works directors. And I think it's kind of a specialty, um, like conservation. I mean, there's too much work to be done by a conservation commission that the select board wouldn't want to do your job and that job. And that's why I think the commission's important. And um, I think right now on the commission, every one of the members was appointed at one time or another. They may have run, like run after being appointed, but I think every one of the members was appointed at one time or another. That is correct. I've gotten the history of the appointments. Appointments. Every one of them has been appointed, but been reelected, or or so on and so forth. But they originally got on there from an appointed position. So the idea that it has to be elected, I think that is a, I think that's an old, that's an, not an older concept, but I think we see the public works department from other towns and they're being very successful. I think that's just kind of the way things moved over years and now it's Norton's time to kind of evaluate it and see if it's see if the town people think it's the time to do it. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Look forward to uh seeing this get broke the point in time for uh town meeting. That's great. So you know I and I appreciate it. And I'll have actually the article like I said next week I'll make sure I have the the, you'll have two documents. You'll actually have the, the, what's being proposed as the article. Uh, and then you'll actually have what, what, uh, what the changes are, what's the proposed changes and what the original says. Yeah. 
Ah, c'est bon, c'est Thank you. Jump back on to uh, the establishment of late fees or fines relating to license renewals. Chairman? Look, so as you said at the beginning of the meeting when we were voting on our renewal, it wasn't a very early one, it was a very late one. And um, so Jennifer um, did some research into uh, what other communities are doing and got some responses um, for people that file late. I mean, they get noticed well in advance. They know when these licenses are due and it's just frustrating, uh, a lot of work to keep chasing them. So I, I would like to see if we could put a fine in place of a hundred dollars for not filing on time. And I, I think I provided you with the email and eight communities that responded do charge a fine. I was amazed, uh, six charge a fine and eight, they lose their license if they don't renew on time. I mean, that's tough to do that to a business to just uh, refuse to vote late apps and the establishment loses their license. Uh, that's that's pretty severe. But um, just hopefully if they know they're going to pay an extra $100 if they don't renew on time, I think it's something that hopefully would uh, encourage people to do the work on time. And so, Mike, are you saying that if, if they, like the deadline's December 31st, if they miss that, then it's automatically $100, or is there a grace period, or like a $50 this date, $100 that date? Um, we could do something like that. They, um, you know, they're supposed to have them in, um, I don't know the date off the top of my head, um, but earlier, they're supposed to have them in so they can all be voted before December 31st, so you could say, if they don't get them in by that date that we give them the end of November, whatever it is, $50. If you go to December 31st and you don't have it in, it's another $50. I support the late fees. I don't, I don't know what specifically the schedule. I'm not familiar with what others are doing or, but I, I don't, I don't see any reason not to take your, your opinion on this. I, I think there has to be something, you know, to to get these folks to do it because we it's year after year that we're we're backed against a corner and I know Jen, you know, um spends a lot of time getting those through on time and then chasing down us to get signatures when some people are out of town or spending holidays. So um I'm for it. Sorry, Christine. No, 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 that's okay. I, I was I was gonna agree. My question is where so say he gets a hundred dollar lease fee. Where does that go? What does that go towards? It would just go to the general fund. Okay. Is it yeah, and I think during COVID, I think obviously everyone right. was giving grace periods, but we're beyond that. And we just got to, you know, I, I always take my lumps and I pay the fines because I'm late on everything. So, um, but that's, that's the way it is. So if I decide to get organized, I don't have to pay all these fines, but whatever. So um, right now, the renewals, uh, Jen was just reminding me, are uh, due on November 1st. So if, if they don't get it in by November 1st, then they pay, um, you know, a $50 fine. And if they don't get it in by December 31st, I mean, a, a month, uh, two months almost late, um, then there'll be another $50 fine. And, and Mike, how do, how do we communicate to them? Like, are we reaching out to them 60 days beforehand and then sending a reminder? They, yep, they all get a letter um, from Jen stating that uh, it's okay. license renewal time and what the fees are and when it's due. And um, so they receive all that in the mail and we'll just add to the letter if you don't return the license by November 1st, there'll be a $50 fine. If you don't return it by December 31st, there'll be another $50 fine and you run the you run the possibility of being shut down if you don't file by December 31st, because technically it's a new year. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, like they're operating, I mean, I didn't even shut down on January. Right. And we, I mean, we could have shut them down. Um, yeah, I, 
I'll throw my voice at the chorus that, you know, I think uh, a $50 fine from November 1st to December 31st, followed by a $50, an additional 50 after that makes sense. Um, there's plenty of notice and this is an annual thing. It shouldn't be a surprise to, to anyone uh, and it keeps things compliant. So. Thank that, you. That sound, uh, do we need to formally vote on that? How does this get implemented? Um, I would, uh, if you could vote, uh, just what the chairman just said, $50 late fee um, for any um, licenses not returned on time and $50 if the date is, you know, by December 31st, it's not returned another $50. All right. Uh, so, Chair, I would entertain a motion to implement a late fee structure uh, in accordance with what the town manager has laid out. Um, $50 fine from approximately November 1st to December 31st, uh, with an additional $50 fine if not renewed um, by the 31st of December. Michael, you're muted. Still muted. Can we, um, can you, Jack, can you just add, I'm sorry, my cat is all over me. Uh, can you just speak all commercial licenses, Mike? Or can we be very specific on which licenses? Or yeah. I, uh, These are common VIC and liquor licenses. For, I'll amend my motion to include uh, common VIC and alcohol. Liquor. Well, actually, no, I stand corrected. Common VIC, liquor, all the licenses you, you do all the time, common VIC. Um, alcohol, exactly. entertainment, uh, class one, class two, all those go out at the same time. Jack, if, if, if I may, Mike, would it just make sense to put it down in writing and then come back to it next week and sure. we just yeah. vote on it? Just yeah. so we get it, we get it right. Great. I just don't want to, I just would check, Mike, I just don't want it to fall in there somehow, somewhere you did something and is it, we applied a charity, charity license in here somehow, in some way, yep. you know, I just don't want to. I don't want to waste my rather yep. have a license in front of us. No, we're right. Good. Thank you. All right. So we'll uh, we'll circle back to that one uh, at our next meeting. I think that's a, a good idea. Uh, da, 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 da. Mike, you're still on the hot seat. This is an okay. update on the MBTA Community Multifamily Zoning Districts. Yeah, we just wanted to give you um, a brief overview we, you know there's still be some more research um, in, into this and we'll come back to you um, this legislation was recently passed <clears throat> by the legislature and signed and uh, for communities that are considered mbta communities which we are um, if you have um, they have a multi-family zoning requirement for for MBTA communities, which uh, Paul will have some slides on, but just a quick overview. It's uh, you have to designate, you have to have at least 50 acres in your community that could be utilized as multifamily. And those 50 acres would um, have to uh, support uh, 15 units per acre. So in Norton, that would be 750 um, units, and they cannot be restricted as to one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom. So, you know, in effect, you could have all three bedrooms, which could have two kids in each unit, and, you know, could be a significant number of children. But um, Paul's got some slides he wants to show you. I don't know, Mike, you did a great job. I don't know that I have a whole lot left. Okay, Paul, before you start, can I ask, is this, is this 50 new acres or is this, like, can we zone it on um, properties now that are already multi-tenant? You, you can, you have, we have options. Okay. We have options. So, uh, do you mind if I share my screen? Uh, go for it, Paul. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Mike, Mike did a great job of summarizing it. Um, I assume you you all can see this. Yes, yes we can. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna go through this a bit quicker, but um, Mike's already kind of covered why the requirement and, um, and the requirements themselves. So I'll spend a little more time on the timeframes and 
what do we need to accomplish and what happens if we don't comply and that's a that's a biggie because the state actually has uh, uh some pretty significant penalties but you know it's important we just you know this is achievable this is very achievable um and we'll we'll you know we'll go through the right process to get this done we're still very early in the process um as mike said we're already an mbta community uh the thing i just want to add here is the state was doing this to address a, a housing crisis that's happening within the commonwealth but actually on both coasts where housing prices have gotten so out of out of uh, well housing prices have escalated significantly just in the last year a lot of residential properties in the country went up by almost 20 percent in value and as you know here even in norton now homes are still selling over asking price i was just looking at some uh, uh, some recent sales price data on single family homes and the ones i looked at were actually again selling above the uh, above the asking the other thing is mike mentioned about the bedrooms um, the, a concern that the Commonwealth was looking at is making sure that housing's family friendly. In many parts of the state, uh, you know, especially around the Metro Boston area, you're seeing a lot of one unit or one bedroom units. You know, um, they're not considered family friendly. And there's a number of economic reasons for that. So the state has enacted this legislation to attempt to uh, address affordability for not only low income, but I think moderate income and combining this with trying to help ridership on the T. Um, so Mike has gone through this. I, the thing I want to mention here that um, a couple of things, as Mike's mentioned, we're looking at accommodating up to 700, at least 750 units. But it, what's important here is that's not a mandate for us to actually produce 750 units. What it means is we at least designate an area where there's a potential for it so renee to your question my understanding is we would we could put this over in fact they want us to put this over a uh, area where there's already a lot of compact development so i think they understand that most towns don't have large vacant areas of land a that could do it and also b just i'm going to go ahead here under location they want these to be located within what they call a reasonable access to a transit station, which here we're talking about either Mansfield or Attleboro. But it's also consistent with their sustainable development principles, which which is areas that are already uh, con have concentrated development. It's areas where we already have our infrastructure. And if we're talking about 15 units an acre, we really need to be you know, very prescriptive where we put it, not only that you know, this could be an opportunity to put that, that this more intensive amount of development in areas where already have infrastructure, like in a particularly sewer. Um, we also want to put it, you know, Norton's a very low density town and 15 units an acre is significantly higher than anything we have here. So where we put it is going to be important because we don't want it to have, you know, a very adverse impact to um, a residential area a low density residential area, which is the majority of what we have. Um, a couple things here, uh, as Mike mentioned, uh, no age restrictions or limits to the number of bedroom size, number of occupants. The good thing is our bylaw already does this. We don't put limits as to how many size, what the size of the units are, age or anything like that. But we would specifically say you can't in this whatever this zoning district is, is you couldn't do this. Ours doesn't call it out, but we would now need to call it out. Um, the 50 units, uh, I'm mean, sorry, it has to be, the district has to be 50 acres minimum. Uh, it It's not clear, They're, they need to clarify if that's all contiguous. I think it is, but then they talk uh, in the guidance about if we do an overlay district that we could do 25 contiguous and another 25 nearby um and then um so on, on and with this top bullet too when we say multifamily has to be allowed as of right we, we can't require a special permit and right now uh the couple of zoning districts that we do allow 
multifamily, it is by special permit. So we will have to come up with a category that um, that is allows it as of right. We still might be able to require us. We still will be able to require a site plan. We just can't do the special permit. And we need to determine as we go forward, is this a new zoning district or is this a new overlay district? Uh, you, you all recall you did the marijuana overlay district. We could do something similar um, by way of an overlay district. So you keep your base zoning, but then if criteria are met, they could build this residential, um, you know, uh, pr you know, build residential development to meet the intent of the of the requirements of the new zoning district. Um, so the, the good news is, is the state essentially is giving us two years to get this done. Um, by the end of 2024, we have to have it adopted. And of course, that means going through town meeting, it's a zoning change. So, uh, but backing up, um, the first couple steps are, are this year are very achievable. Uh, by the end of March, uh, the state uh, Department of Housing and Community Development is accepting comments and questions on the guidelines. Uh, I've already submitted some questions to them. Uh, they will then provide final guidance after uh, after the uh, March. Um, the next thing, it, by May 2nd, we have to complete what they call the MBTA Community Information Form. Um, in fact, we will be done. This thing will be, we will complete this form. I'll complete it as soon as the minutes to this meeting is um, approved by you. They basically want to just know an acknowledgement that we're having this meeting tonight. They are requiring that all select boards are notified before May 2nd of of uh, the requirements that are coming forward. So um, I'm, I've already begun. I'm nearly complete with that app, with the community information form. I just essentially need to wait for the minutes to be approved and then uploaded. And then it starts to get more fun. Um, by July of 23, the state must approve our timeline and action plan for how we're going to do this. And then by December uh, 31st of 24, we have a, the final adoption date. And then at 90 days after adoption, we have to submit the plan uh, to, or not the plan, but the adopted district to the state in requesting their determination for full compliance. So, uh, you know, we have to do it. Uh, there are significant penalties if we don't do it. Um, It'll make us ineligible for MassWorks, uh, the local capital projects funds, and the housing choice initiatives funds. Um, I know we've used MassWorks in the past. We use local capital projects funds. Housing choice is a new one. We're not eligible yet, but you know, if the housing community wants to go forward with it, we 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 don't want them to be ineligible because we didn't get the zoning district in place. Um, so the good news too is that uh, the state is offering up a lot of assistance to us. They're still trying to put this together, but there will be technical assistance available to us. Um, I, I've already reached out to Serpid about the uh, DLTA funds to see if if they're working on this, if they're if they're planning to do technical assistance for communities in Serpid's region. Um, I'd really prefer to stay away from applying for consulting services through Community One Stop. Uh, that's a, uh, a process that's uh, opening that um, you'll recall we actually use Community One Stop to get the Brownfield grants for Reed and Barton. And recently we also received the parking district study. Uh, there's some other things that I think if we would be applying for for Community One Stop. I would rather leave that open and either use the DLTA funding or the, the land use planning grant to get a consultant on board. And I do want to, I, I have reached out to Serpent to see what are they planning to do to help communities with this, because the regional planning agencies are supposed to be gearing up to provide technical assistance, just what the state told us. And then, um, you know, 2022, uh, we will be completing that community information form very shortly. We will need to look at um, hiring a consultant using those grant funds. 
it's probably worth our while to start identifying locations, potential locations for siting the district and uh, determining, you know, are we going to do a new base zoning district or an overlay district? I, I, some of these things are going to change. This is right now, I'm still on some of these just guessing that's what we, we will accomplish this year. Um, and, uh, but, you know, as I think once we start getting down the road and the final guidance is out and we start getting some movement on getting a consultant, we'll, we'll be in a much clearer position. And of course, we'll also need to figure out a public engagement process. And then we have to start drafting that work plan, which is due in uh, 2023. And that's, that's the end of my presentation. So if you have any questions. Quite a few, but um, I will let my my colleagues go first. Michael, I saw your hand. Um, Paul, when does the uh, planning board take this up as, as a whole? Have they already taken it up? And I know that as the planning board going to, what's the planning board's direction on this? Uh, so I will be presenting this to them. I'll be showing them the same presentation. Um, interestingly, it, the, the, the guidance that we're getting from the state, not the guidance, the requirement is it's the select board at least needs to, we have to present to the select board, which was a question I was curious why, you know, this is a zoning change, which typically follows through a planning board. So, um, so in two weeks, I'll be doing this presentation for them. And it's nice that you presented to us, but you know, if everyone stays in their lanes, this isn't us. <laughs> this is the planning right. board. <laughs> right. This is just an overview of, that. Yeah. you know, there's a lot I don't know. None of us know at this point, but the planning board needs to get heavily involved with it. And, and, you know, I would say that it's important as this starts to grow as part of the work plan, they need to be part of that work plan. And um, I think we have a pretty good process now with the planning board when it comes to zoning changes bylaw changes that in fact we have a subcommittee meeting tomorrow to look at a couple of changes that we're proposing at springtown meeting nothing to do with any of this but they need to uh we i need i'll be getting it on their radar in two weeks but it is interesting why the state didn't ask for the planning board to have that we have proof that the planning board was told about this but I would imagine it has something to do with the non-compliance part, right? That they want to make sure that it's, it's, I mean, I think that both boards should have been included in that, but I imagine that, that given what you said, you know, can happen if we don't comply and what we lose, um, yeah. that has, that has budgetary impact, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. They, uh, it, the state has been really good, particularly really good in the last couple of years with COVID with, you know, providing funding, but uh, this was their, uh, you know, they've given us plenty of carrots. Now here's the stick. So, and it doesn't, We, I, I, it's probably a negative way of putting it. If we do this right, there could be a lot to gain. I mean, think about like with the water and sewer, you get a development of that intensity. All of a sudden, that's a lot of hookups, a lot of connections that they get. And that's fees for them. And if we, you know, again, if we're trying to direct it, in the corridors, again, that might help. You know, the idea is that it would also help potentially our commercial, our retail businesses and other other businesses in town. So, I want to look at this as a positive that we want to do it in the right way. Uh, I think it's it'll be a good opportunity to to look at, especially when you're talking about something this intensive, that we look at design, uh, in making sure that it's just designed well. There are, um, I kind of skipped over this, but there was an illustration in there that shows you there are types of developments that don't look like they're that intensive and yet they're 15 units an acre. And those are the types of things that we should be um, accommodating. Small apartments, uh, you know, a mixture of things that we could potentially do. It doesn't have to be one big apartment complex. There's a whole host of things that it could be, and I think we need to explore it. And, and Paul, do you see any um, symmetry with um, any of the items in the master plan that this may yeah. enhance? Yeah, I do. Uh, because the while this was going on, while we were working on the master plan, the master plan does talk about directing 
uh, more intensive residential development to our corridors and some other key spots. But yeah, so it, I, I think that's, we want to make sure that we're implementing what's in the plan. Great. Um, any other questions for Paul before I take my shot? Just, just one, Jack. Um, Paul, you mentioned that you shared or, or that you sent some questions. Can you just share those with the board? Yeah, I'll try to remember. There were uh, so one was uh, there's a lot of there's some analytical work they're going to want communities to provide, uh, essentially showing, uh, you know, what would be the impacts to say water and sewer. They provide no guidance on it, and I, I've asked them you know, what what assumptions are we supposed to make because if they say you need 750 units on day one, right? You know, that's an unrealistic expectation. And uh, so they need to tell us uh, if, if we're doing our, what they call capacity studies, like what level of growth are they expecting over a period of time? That way it helps us prepare for things, but it also gives us reality because again, we're not gonna see 750 units in one project. And so, um, and then what happens, what happens if the community um, doesn't know, I mean, what happens if the, com the community is projecting a, a capacity deficit? What, what does the state do to us then? Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's a biggie. Uh, another one that I asked was that 90 day requirement after we get it submitted to town meeting. Well, we are required by by state law to uh, file any zoning changes that get approved at town meeting with the attorney general. They get 90 days to look at it. And now frequently in the last couple of years, they are now asking for and giving themselves extensions to the 90 day. So I've asked the state, well, are you coordinating with the AG's office? And what happens if the AG doesn't give us a response back? Are you expecting them to Give a, are you expecting them to have responded before we submit this to you? And I'm I'm confused too because you know the state signing off on it, another agency. I mean that's isn't that the AG's responsibility? So just want to understand and get clarification on that. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. I think yeah, there's a. There's a lot of questions on how this is going to be implemented uh, and the timing, right? It sounds like we need to make provisions for this development, but not necessarily are required to build it, right? It requires a developer to come in and actually invest and deem that this is a worthwhile investment for them. And we're not going to be held to, say, enticing developers to come in to build these units. Right. Okay. Correct. Correct. It, it, uh, right. That's that's right. It's just a a, a, poss a potential of what could happen at a site. Uh, I, again, I, you know, if you look at, say, for example, Mansfield Avenue, where the sewer line runs, again, that might be a great location. It's one of the closest points to the Mansfield station, it has sewer, but there's not much vacant land there. Now, could that land redevelop? Yeah, it could. It could. But, um, you know, you know, we have, you know, is, are some of the industrial sites over there going to tear down and redevelop? I, I don't think so. Not many, not for a long, long time. So, you know, those are all considerations that we, we have to factor in, but you, we don't have much vacant land in town. Mm. I mean, certainly not where, where it's commercial. Or industrial. I mean, first of all, I don't think we would be putting, we can't put this in an industrial area, nor would we want to, but there's not much vacant land left. And so, you know, we're, you know, we are, you know, that's a factor that we have to consider that I hope the state will provide guidance because what if you're a town that, you know, doesn't have any vacant parcels on the boundaries they've put in? And it may be that it's close to a station it's it's got all the infrastructure you need you know be curious to see what the state says about that but you know they're doing their best to try to not make this a one-size-fits-all but 
it's still kind of a one size fits all. So we'll work with them to, and, and with the community to figure out, you know, what's that, what does that district look like and where is it? That's great. Um, yeah, that's, uh, do you happen to know off the top of your head how large the, um, the apartments by 495 are, the ones by um, where okay. Blue Star is? Yeah, 274 East Main. That's what it is, yeah. It's a couple, that's the 40V. I don't know how many units is there. I'm the thing too to, to keep in mind, and I want to go down this too much, is this is 15 units gross versus net. Mm -hmm. So it, it's less dense than if they had said 15 units net, which means you take out your parking, your stormwater, you can factor all of that in. But okay. it, it's, but even like that's our probably our most intensive, you know, Red Mill's pretty, pretty much there too, but my guess is if we looked at it, it's probably not 15 units an acre. Right. But again, you can design some wonderful buildings that that could fit in well in certain areas of town that, you know, probably wouldn't be uh, uh, looking much out of character with the rest of the area. Sure. Yeah. For, for my part, I think um, doing some community outreach with this is going to be important. I mean, this yeah. is a a, a substantial amount of development that could be on the books. Uh, if it's you know, 750 units, even if it's one person per uh, unit, that's about a 4% bump in town population, right? And they're, they're saying yeah. that it's not limited to one bedroom. So that's, uh, that's a lot. It is. But one thing we want to keep in mind too is, let's say we, um, let's again, pick on, not pick on Mansfield Ave, but that's all zone commercial which if those were to redevelop as commercial, there's still, you know, commercial allows, it's one of our most intensive zoning districts. So it may be not so much of an apples to oranges comparison as we think. Uh, I realize one's residential, one's commercial, but still, um, uh, it, you still could see some changes without changing zoning, you know, if conditions are, are right. But it, yeah, this is a this is a change. Their requirement does definitely lead to a change, and so we need to be our process needs to be run perfectly, and we need to put in standards that you know the community can support. And I think design is really crucial here. And we started to get we, we get with the village center core is an example of better design standards. And we would need to put something in, uh, you know, that's better than village center core probably. All right. So and thanks, Paul. I uh, look forward to hearing more from you as the process goes on and more information becomes available. Well, thank you. Everyone have a good night. You too. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, an item I asked to be put on there, just bringing back the topic of uh, appointing a charter review committee. So this is um, and as a follow up to the charter commission, which was elected, proposed um, a new charter. This is something that is within the town bylaws or town charter that every uh, 10 years we can appoint a committee. We did elect to defer to allow the Charter Commission to do their work. Um, this is an opportunity to convene a group with members appointed by uh, a number of different bodies in town um, to do their own review and make some recommendations. Unlike the Charter Commission, these would be uh, non-binding. So ultimately it's up to, I believe, the select board to choose to move forward or not, uh, put them on the ballot in town meeting for adoption. Um, if possible, I'd like to take the, the board's temperature on this and see if we can uh, perhaps advance this and start informing uh, the other appointing authorities that we would like to get this process started uh, relatively soon. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my only, my only thought is again, um, there was a lot of animosity around whether whichever side you fell on um, for or against the Charter Commission and their findings. Um, 
I would just, I would just be cautious of it not looking or feeling like, you know, the select board is now going another route. Like we didn't get it passed the first time. And so therefore, um, again, I get it. It's non-binding and it's totally different. It just, again, it's, it's still fresh in a lot of people's, I remember still standing there when people were screaming. So, um, just throwing it out there. Yep. Nope, absolutely. Michael? Um, a couple of things, Meg. Um, this would be just to review the charter and so forth. It, would, it, it cannot take on a change of government, um, to, to the best of my knowledge. I, I agree, but if the board is making recommendations based on what they are saying, then it just, again, looks like yeah. um, it no, just looks a little they funny. Impose, they can't impose, it, 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 the, 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 from what I've understood, Mike, you might have to correct me on this, they can't even propose a change of government in this. This this group can't even propose a change of government. All they can do is make changes to the uh, suggest changes to the charter uh, outside of the form of government. Uh, I I believe that's incorrect. Because I think the last time a charter committee was convened, a recommendation was made to move to a, a town council or away from a select board style. Um, I, think I don't know how, about it, Jack. I was under the impression yeah. that they, they, could, they, could, they could get signatures for the last proposal to put it back on without any changes, mm -hmm. but they couldn't do the process again unless they did the 200 signatures. It wouldn't have been as many as everyone, but I'm going to back off. I don't know enough. So, and, so and they, my... Sorry, and I just want to clarify one thing that sure. Michael said. So this is, this is different than the, the Charter Commission. Like I said, that that, that required uh, over 2,000 signatures, and it became an independent body that presented its own work. This is a, a different different group, a committee that is appointed by uh, select board, school committee, um, and I believe at least a few others that can do virtually the same thing. The recommendations get made. It would still need to go through uh, any any formal process to. Um, adopt a charter change, so it needs to be a ballot vote as well as a town meeting vote. So the, the process to change the charter remains the same, and the composition of the group is made up differently. And I believe it's up to the select board whether or not it even makes it onto the town meeting warrant or a town election. So. You know, I'm, totally, I'm totally for it. Again, I just wanted to throw that out there as just food for thought. Yep. No, Meg, I, I think it's a, I think it's a good point, and you know I'm for this because I think the, the the charter commission overall. I mean that was a huge effort, right? There were a lot of components to it, but I think kind of like our conversation in the public works depart public public works department that there are some I don't want to call them lower hanging fruits, but but some components of what was recommended I think that are good and would be valuable for the town, and it would be it would be good for a group to kind of you know, look at those and, and provide the recommendation. You know, back to Jack's point, there's there's nothing that we have to do. I know previously it, it was recommended um, to the board for for a change, but you know, that I don't see this necessarily as that or like uh, let's redo charter commission. I see it as are there opportunities that, that potentially we can break down and, and present better to the town or, you know, to support some positive change and, and not an overall package deal. Now, although that might be the recommendation that comes out. Yeah. No, no, totally for it. I, I totally get it. I have thick skin. I don't really care what anyone thinks of me anymore. <laughs> it's fine. Michael? Sure. Oh, sorry, Christine, we'll circle right back. No, I just, can you just clarify who would be the, on the commission or committee? Uh, so I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but it, it's in. I'll circulate it around um, for a reference later on. Uh, it is, and, and Mike, I don't know if you recall from your intensive study of town charters and uh, your downtime, uh, I believe it's a, either a seven or nine member committee um, with various boards and groups in town being able to appoint members uh, from the public. Um, I'll see if I can pull it up while we while we talk about the next. Topic. No, that that's okay. I'm just trying to to like I, I was following for a second and then I kind of lost it. So so it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I'm looking up too, Jack. I'm just I was just trying to figure out what what like I, like 
I would support reviewing the charter. Just I'm just trying to figure out what it. You, you're saying it's not the same as what just we just had. It's different. But I was just trying to figure out why it's different. Uh, so, not an independent body that's going to make recommendations, like a full commission report recommendation for the town to vote on. This is a committee that we would appoint, or we and various other committees would appoint folks to sit on, and they would review different things. And then they would come back and make recommendations, but nothing's binding, nothing. If we decide as a select board not to put anything forth to town meeting, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, okay, so so they would just like pick like slowly pick apart the charter and be like maybe we could try this instead, and then we as a select board would be like, mm, you know what, no. Like the public works, if if my if Michael didn't sort of spearhead that effort, that would be a good example of something they might say. You know what, we really think this is something that is worth looking at, and um, you know, so. So it's in uh. So I guess. Heaven. Oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. go ahead. You finish. No, I was just the because the last group was elected by the last right. Was the, the last group was elected, so mm -hmm. this would be appointed. So that's one of the one of the changes. I was just trying to like like you know pull the two sides apart um, as to the difference. Okay. No, I'm I'm getting it. Thank you. Yeah, so like one of the. The unique features of the charter commission which just went through is that their whatever their recommendation is has to proceed to a ballot vote uh, my understanding of the charter review committee is that it does not necessarily need to go to a ballot vote uh, but the specifics are in section 7-7 of the town charter uh and it says a special committee shall be established for the purpose of reviewing this charter and to make a report with recommendations to the town meeting concerning any proposed amendments which said committee may determine to be necessary or desirable uh it can shall consist of nine voters who shall be chosen as follows uh the select board school committee planning board and the board of assessors so those are the four uh or four of the elected boards in town uh, shall each designate one person the finance committee shall designate two persons and three persons shall be appointed by the town moderator uh, persons appointed by said agencies may but not but need not be members of the agency by which they are designated so they could be members of those boards or not uh, the persons appointed by the town moderator shall be voters not otherwise involved in town government as a member of any appointed or elected town agency uh, and they have to need to organize within 30 days of the call of the select board to establish said committee now could you read um could you read the section about that on the when on the year that they're supposed to be appointed as well uh yep so in each year ending in a zero a special committee shall be established is uh, the start of that yep and that, that's Jim. Yep. so I wouldn't support this right now because it's the charter. We saw kind of what the charter, the, the, the old process did to the town. I think we like it separated. I know that we decided to, to wait, um, but we are two years past kind of that kind of uh, pointing on a, a year of zero. Um, I just, you know, right now I, I just, I would, I probably wouldn't support, um, support the, the, the call for a charge. Um, so my understanding of reading that language is that should the select board vote to move forward with this it starts a 30-day clock for the group to convene um, I would not want to hold that vote until we at least have a discussion with the other potential appointing bodies to make sure that they are aware uh, 30 days is a pretty tight timeline in this day and age um, so um, we comfortable making inquiries out to the other boards to let them know that this is something that may be coming and we can take a formal vote at which point the direction will be, be clear but at least give them a heads up
Yeah, that makes sense. Jack, do we have um, do we have a joint meeting? I know we had some discussion. Do we have one on calendar at least with uh, FinCom and school committee? I don't believe we do. Um, it is something that we should definitely get on the books, especially in the run up to um, annual town meeting. So, Mike, perhaps we can have a little conversation with um, Denez and Amy about setting up a super fun con meeting. All right. Um, any other new business for tonight? Jack, just real quick question about that. What would be the purpose and the agenda of that? I mean, I'm just some of those meetings, and, and, and it's great that we get to collaborate, but it seems kind of almost like it's a little directionless. So I'm just curious, would we be able to see an agenda of people kind of like, I mean, don't get me wrong, I want to collaborate with those groups, but it just seems, I mean, what, what would be the purpose of, of, of kind of getting the joint meeting with the school committee and the, and the student college? On there, besides obviously, this is one of the subject matters that makes sense. But it would be what other subject you want? Uh, from a philosophical standpoint, I, I find that those meetings help reinforce the, the groups working together in a collaborative fashion. I think what would be beneficial is a single cohesive agenda. Where we've stumbled in the past is that the select board has their agenda, school committee has their own, and then FinCom um, sometimes has their own and sometimes just comes. And, hangs out. So I think working together to develop a single cohesive agenda with a very tightly focused two to three topics about, you know, objectives and goals for either town meeting or coming up, uh, relevant updates would be what I would like to see on there. That sounds great. And that, I think that's really, I mean, if, if I sounded very negative, that's more, more what I was trying to get at. We just make sure we get very focused. Sometimes I feel like if we've done it, I think I've sat to uh, two of them before. It was just kind of like we we're just kind of floating out there. Yep. Uh, I, I agree. And if there's separate agenda items, then one or more boards is waiting for the other one to finish their their business before anything can happen. It's it's not a good use of everybody's time. So I agree. All right. So uh, Mike and I will take that action to to get that meeting scheduled. All right. Um, seeing no other new business, uh, Mike, we'll turn it over to you for a town manager update. <clears throat> so I just wanted to, um, on the grant updates, um, the chief went over his, and Beth Rossi also received a grant, a field demonstration grant for marketing and outreach, um, $7,800. And you can picture Beth saying, that, saying this to me, I asked her, so what are you gonna do with that? She said, we're gonna make the Norton Senior Center, the talk of the town. So uh, she'll, she'll be doing a PR campaign, um, a whole marketing campaign, banners, posters, postcards, and mailings. And uh, I can I imagine she'll do a great job. I can, I can see it now. So. And um, I just wanted to say that um, right now, the um, highway department doesn't have anyone on COVID, but unfortunately, the rise in COVID has called the national caused the National Guard to call up two of the employees from the highway department. So they are now out with the National Guard. Uh, but uh, I want to thank them. They did a great job uh, and Water and Sewer also helped out with them. They did a great job in the last storm um, being shot staffed. And um, from what I didn't receive any complaints on uh, the conditions of the roads. So, I want to thank them. And I just want to recognize uh, Chief Clark, who has now been inducted into as being the president of the Southeastern Massachusetts Police Chiefs Association. Um, I had the honor of doing the inductions at the ceremony. And, um, you know, the chief has uh, been an officer in Norton for 30 worked in the Norton Police Department for 30 years and been chief for 14 and uh, you know has done a great job well before the talk of uh, police reform. He worked to uh, get a fully accredited department, started the problem orientated uh, policing, um, started working with the clinician to help out during these times uh, 
where there are a lot of uh, mental health issues uh, that people are dealing with that, uh, you know, by having this being proactive with the clinician, it prevents problems later on down the line. And uh, uh, we're lucky to have the chief there. And uh, they did give the chief an award, recognizing the tough year that he's been through, um, losing two members of the department and his mother all in the same year. So uh, want to uh, thank Brian and does a great job for us. And just uh, on the American Rescue Plan update, um, Bristol County has their portal working now so that uh, we can uh, work to access funds from Bristol County to the town of Norton. Um, it's roughly $3 million um, from Bristol County and plan on targeting that for infrastructure, water and sewer projects. So um, I did meet with the water and sewer um, uh, chairman and uh, Frank and um, John and the engineers from uh, Western and Sampson um, to see um, what projects they could prioritize. Um, they had a, about $4 million in projects, um, but uh, one of the big pushes under uh, the American Rescue and Recovery Plan is water and wastewater projects. So um, we're hoping uh, that they'll come forward with uh, finalizing a few of those so that we can uh, utilize this money for that. And just some other things we're looking at. Um, also with those funds, the uh, fire department um, recently um, purchased a machine so that they can do the PCR test directly without having to send them out. So they can have results um, within 10 to 15 minutes rather than sending them to a lab and having to wait two to three days to get your results. So, um, you know, that'll be uh, very helpful, especially, uh, you know, with the staff they have that are in close contact all the time to uh, get those results right away so that we don't have um, any cases spreading uh, in the department. Um, also, we're looking at upgrading the emergency operations center with some funds. Paul's looking, talking to businesses, small businesses, to see what we can do to help them um, through this. And uh, you know, we'll we'll still be looking for different ideas, and we'll come forward with those as we uh, move along. I know the um, senior center is using this these funds to uh, help with more hours for their outreach counselor. And Chief Clark is using these funds when necessary for more hours for the clinician. So um, this will be a big help in getting us through everything we're going through right now. That's great, Mike. Um, one thing I have seen percolating in other communities and uh, if you wanna start getting ahead of the curve because the way these things tend to go, they always make their way around. Um, if we can develop um, a record or a spreadsheet of what the various um, funds have been used for or since they started coming out, just a, a, a full accounting of that, um, putting it up online, I think would probably curtail um, some questions that we'll get at, at some point in the future. Okay, sure. Um, and just a couple other things, um, the assessors, um, you know, they do have a vacancy and it's a very important uh, position to fill. So if you know anyone or anyone's interested, um, it's a great board to be on, you know, it's three members. Uh, they meet once or twice a month. Their meetings are usually only an hour. Uh, it's interesting and um, we're going to have another vacancy because I don't think one of the members is going to run for re-election. So if you know anybody that's interested, it's a it's a great board, uh, good working environment, and uh, I hope some residents will step forward. And just one other thing, last night the building committee um, voted to approve um, the, uh, we're going to develop a contract now, but they voted to approve the amounts that um, DBVW will be charging for the senior center community support 
Senior Community Support Center, $901,978. And for the Town Hall, uh, $1,924,251. So DBVW is the architect. And uh, with their vote last night, this will allow us to give them notice to proceed and start working on a contract. So the projects uh, are moving forward. Mike, do you have any update uh, from them on the uh, on the athletic field as well? Um, I know the last update on the athletic field, I believe they have a hearing um, at conservation Monday night. Um, that the hearing was continued. Um, their uh, con the consultant for the conservation commission was looking for some more information, and uh, so that was continued to this coming Monday, I believe. Okay, and and is the the PBC actively involved in that? Because I I thought their role spanned the entire. They are. Um, okay. Because I know at the last meeting uh, they did have an update from the school department. Okay. Thank you. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, Laptop is at one percent, so I've turned off on the camera to try to, uh, to get to the end of the meeting. Um, so um, I'll jump to warrants. So I have approved payroll warrant PR 22-15 for the week ended January 8th, 2022. Warrant dated January 13, 2022, in the amount of one million seven hundred forty-two thousand eight hundred eleven dollars and fifty-six cents as well as invoice warrants AP 22-29, dated January 13th, 2022, in the amount of $1,261,257.55, and invoice warrant AP 22-30, dated January 20th, 2022, in the amount of $84,946.28. Uh, which leads us to our next meeting scheduled for uh, Wednesday, February 2nd. Uh, is there any other business to come before the board this evening? Or anyone have report and mail that we skipped over? Oh, did I miss that? I, sorry. I went That's right okay. It's right, it's right at the bottom. So We just want to drag this out to the 1% runs out, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, seeing no report and mail, uh, Oh, looks like, uh, awesome. yeah, Michael. All right. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> the reporter mail, uh, the, um, acting chair, would be open to a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. Uh, Adrian Lee has second the uh, uh, motion with Christine is second from May. All in favor, um, roll call. Uh, Christine? Yes. Nay? Yes. Uh, Renee? Yes. And I see them a yes. Thank you, guys. Oh. We always have to wrap it up for him. <laughs> oh, he's trying to come back. Oh, oh we're all done. Ah, we're all done, done Jack. <laughs> Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.